Hello, I'm Tom Harbin, host of The Big Picture. And I'm Christina Tobin, founder of Free and Equal Elections Foundation. We're less than one hour from the final U.S. presidential candidates debate between Governor Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party and Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party. Both were selected by you, our viewers, in the last debate on October 23rd in Chicago. Before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about the issues. Joining us from our New York studio is Sam Cedar, host of the Majority Report and from Los Angeles, investigative journalist Amber Lyon. Sam? Thanks, uh, thanks for having me, Tom. Hey, Sam, welcome to the program, or welcome to the, uh, to the debate. And Amber, welcome. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. Christina? Well, thank you. Well, it's wonderful to have both of you this evening, and uh, we're here with, uh, as political correspondents, we're having a debate, uh, actually, in, in an hour, right, at 9 p.m. Eastern. Indeed. And uh, uh, Tom Hartman, as you both may be aware, will be uh, moderating that deb debate you, with me. You and I together. Yes. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. And uh, so Amber and uh, Sam, love to have you on. And um, here, you know, Free and Equal Elections, RT America, we've really united in, in bringing together honest media organizations, honest media like yourself. And uh, we'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, who both of you are, I guess, starting off with, with Amber. Well, I'm an investigative journalist, and I'm a, a former mainstream media journalist. I've, I've since uh, gone independent, and, and I agree with you. It's very important right now for us to have honest and um, accessible journalism, and journalism that really is giving the honest portrayal of what's happening in the United States right now, because a lot of vital stories um, are being censored from even the debates. That's what makes me look forward to tonight's debate, that I know issues will be discussed, like the NDAA, uh, the drone program and a potential war with Iran, issues that were pretty much kept out of, of the other debates, Christina. And Sam, I'm, I'm curious what, what your hot buttons are for tonight. Well, uh, thanks, Tom. And Tom, as you know, I'm a, I'm, I'm a talk show host. Uh, I do a daily show at uh, majority.fm and a, and a brilliant weekend radio one. show. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, I, look, the, uh, Amber touched on a couple of these things. I mean, the, the range of issues that were discussed over the course of the uh, three or four, if you want to include the vice presidential debates, was shockingly narrow. And um, the, the, the sad reality is, um, in many respects, we have two candidates, one of whom will win in terms of the, uh, the general election in Mitt Romney and President Obama, who, who share uh, a, a, a fairly similar world view. And, um, uh, there are differences, of course, but uh, on some of the, 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 the fundamental issues and about the, the, the systemic uh, situation we have in this country, things like wealth disparity, uh, whatnot, uh, they're, they're very similar. So uh, it's, it's, it's good that we're having this opportunity to have representatives uh, from across the political spectrum uh, talk about some of these, these real issues, and I hope that these conversations continue past the election because uh, one way or another it's going to be uh, Mitt Romney or uh, Barack Obama and we still need uh, an, an informed electorate and one that needs to deal with these issues uh, aside from sort of the, 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 the shiny stuff that I think the, the corporate media wants us to pay more attention to. Well, Sam, uh, thank you so much for that. And Amber, uh, just kind of throwing some ideas out there. I think we can all recognize that the two-party stranglehold of the system has uh, really caused a, a lot of the problems that we have today, like the passing, as you mentioned, of the NDAA and uh, the drone mm -hmm. war and the Patriot Act. And, and Amber, I mean, with your, I've researched you and your investigative uh, journalism and what you've done uh, previously with CNN, what you're doing now. Uh, what have you found? Do you find the two-party system? I mean, uh, what, what strikes you and things that maybe they aren't doing that are good for the Americans and why? Why do you think? Well, well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I agree with a lot of the points that have been brought up, that the, the two-party system is, in some ways, a facade. Uh, in, in, in many ways, really, Americans are, are being kind of led into believe that they have a choice. But as Sam was mentioning, when it comes to issues that are, that are vital to the U.S. right now, especially issues dealing with our, our civil liberties, like the NDAA, there really is no difference between the two candidates. Um, I mean, both Romney and Obama say that they support the indefinite detention clause, which takes away our rights as Americans to have a free trial. And it's also very dangerous to journalism because under the NDAA, we can be accused 
of potentially aiding terrorists if we don't give up our sources, and then we could be disappeared as well. And, and it will lead to a chilling effect in the journalism that we need in this country right now to actually be able to expose a lot of these issues that are going on. So, so when it comes to the two candidates, we're being led to believe that we have a choice, but in many ways, we, we really don't. And, and that's why uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to tonight being able to, to discuss that, because when you limit it to two parties and two parties that think so close in, in ideology, then, then you, you really just don't get a choice. Amber, is there a mechanism that you have in mind to take us out of a duopoly and into a multi-party system or even a system where people could participate independent of parties? Well, I, I think that, I mean, there's been a lot of methods proposed, um, but, but I think that something that needs to happen first is the public needs to be educated on, on everything that's going on, and, and that really lies on the shoulder of the media to be able to give the public the truth, because they think they are having a choice between the two parties because the, the uh, third parties aren't being discussed. And so I, I think the first step is to really be able to educate the public so they know everything that's going on and they know that they do have other options. And then from there, we, we can move forward as a nation. Well, um, thank you, Amber. And uh, Sam, jumping into Sam here, uh, towards Sam, uh, do you feel like with Amber, with what she said about parties, politics, the two-party system, uh, she mentioned about media, maybe money in media, money in politics. Uh, do you think that has an impact on things like oh. NDAA, SOPA, and why? I mean, of course. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm not sure how much it has uh, impact on some of the, the civil liberties issues, but I mean, look, you've got $150 billion from the oil industry going into the coffers of broadcast television. If you want to know why there was no question about climate change during uh, any of those debates, uh, that's a great place to start. Uh, the other problem, and, and I tend to focus on, uh, on financial and economic issues, neither one of these candidates uh, in the, uh, the general election, I'm speaking of Obama and Romney, uh, will hold the banks to account for, for crashing our economy. And uh, both of them speak of a so-called debt crisis. And some of your, your viewers may uh, disagree with my, my sense of this, but uh, the fact is I don't believe that we have a debt crisis. I believe that we have a jobs crisis. And I, and I don't believe that we can cut taxes to grow jobs. And I don't believe that um, uh, on, the, on the flip side of that, uh, President Obama has, has focused on jobs uh, as opposed to sort of maintaining some of the, the economic status quo in this country. And so uh, I think there's a whole range of issues that the media, and because of course, you know, we're talking about the corporate media. Most of the people who are reading the news, reporting the news, uh, have far more, uh, their interests are far more aligned with the wealthy people who essentially are our legislators now. And uh, so the idea that, well, we can cut, uh, we, we can raise the Social Security uh, retirement age, or we can cut back on cost of living increases for Social Security because, you know, I, I'm going to work until I'm 75, 80 because my job is, is to sit uh, in a newsroom and talk about it. Uh, so I think there's a real disparity beyond what's, what's going on in the real world and what's happening in newsrooms. And I, I think that's a real problem. And I think that feeds in to the, the journalist perspective on whether or not the two primary candidates that they discuss are really addressing the needs of the American public. Sam, to what extent, I mean, in, in the 92 election, Ross Perot got about 20% of the vote on one issue, which was international trade or so-called free trade. It really cracked open a conversation that basically got shut down during the Clinton presidency uh, because both parties, both Bill Clinton and, and George Herbert Walker Bush, agreed that we should be joining NAFTA and become part of the WTO and that whole thing. Wasn't that an example of how an outside, and you could argue that Ross Perot wasn't even a political party. He was just a billionaire who created a logo and, you know, but brought this issue in and yet it still died. I mean, you know, given that, how big a slog is it for the, some of these individual issues to be carried forward by anybody other than the two major parties? Or, or maybe another way of saying that is to, to what extent do we have to operate outside the party system? To what extent do we have to operate inside the party system to produce these kinds of changes that are necessary? Well, I get, I get two parts of the answer to that. First off, it wasn't just with Ross Perot, it wasn't just the giant sucking sound that he was talking about in terms of NAFTA. He was also one of these guys who was saying that the, uh, 
the national the, the deficit was going to be a big problem for us. Mm -hmm. And that fed in quite nicely into uh, Bill Clinton's narrative because you got to remember, and I know you do, Tom, that uh, Bill Clinton was the head of the DLC. He was uh, the head of the conservative wing of, uh, of the Democratic Party at that time. Yep. And so to a certain extent, what Ross Perot ended up doing was giving uh, Bill Clinton a certain amount of cover uh, to cut things like uh, welfare and uh, to, to, be, to, to carry out a more corporate agenda in some respects. Uh, but you're right, on the part of when we talk about more populist in, uh, uh, issues like uh, trade, uh, it didn't seem to have any uh, implications whatsoever. And so, yeah, it's a huge slog. And I think, you know, on some level, uh, Ross Perot could have done us all a bigger favor, frankly, uh, if he had spent his uh, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars jumping in and out of the race, you'll recall, in actually trying to educate the American public as to the implications of NAFTA, rather than spending that money on an electoral campaign. So uh, in some respects, uh, his, his one issue got swallowed up, and he ended up, in, in some respects, also sort of um, midwifing some other uh, policies that I, I think even he today would see as probably pretty problematic. Well, yeah, thanks, Sam. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, we definitely have issues with uh, job and uh, unemployment and those sort of things. It feels like uh, the way for us to, to resolve these issues, at first we've got to break through that stranglehold of the two-party system because it appears as if they've been playing us for well over a century now, and they really work together in so many ways. And, two. Uh, well, yeah, the two, two, centuries. <laughs> the two centuries now, of course. And, and so through the creation of ballot access barriers and, mm -hmm. of course, electoral reform issues, and Mr. Perot did bring a lot of awareness to that. Yeah. And then the Federal Election Commission Act of 1974, I mean, uh, big hurdles there. And, and I guess, uh, you know, with the debate we're doing tonight, uh, you know, Amber, why do you feel like being a part of this debate, like what kind of issues do you feel you mentioned a little bit of what's important to you, and and uh, mm -hmm. I know you're going to be engaged. You're going to be actually a, there's going to be a question asked by Ms. Uh, uh, Amber here, Lyon, uh, during the debate. We're looking forward yes. to that happening as well. But what sort of issues? Well, well, even the question that I ask has to do with WikiLeaks and whether this, uh, if, if these candidates are elected president, whether they'll consider WikiLeaks to be a national security threat. Also, another issue that isn't uh, discussed in the other debates is, is what will be done with uh, Bradley Manning, whether, whether or not they would release him if they were uh, elected to the presidency. So, so there, there are many issues that, that just weren't covered in, in the fluffy uh, Romney-Obama debates that, that are vital to the American public. Uh, another thing, I mean, we're, we're talking about topics here that uh, that really show how there, there is no choice in the two-party system. If, if you look at NDAA 2013, that has already passed in the House, and that is actually making it U.S. policy to go to war with Iran. So, so essentially, the, the debates you are seeing about whether or not we're going to go to war with Iran during the debates are, are irrelevant, because the legislation has already been written that if Iran is even a perceived threat to the United States, that we have it become our next policy to go and, and attack the country. And that's something that wasn't brought up. And I, I believe with these issues, just being able to bring them up to the public is, is definitely a more honest way to, to allow Americans to understand understand what's going on in our country right now because they're being lied to by the corporate media or not tell, uh, told the whole truth. And, and even when it comes down to presidential debates, they're not being given the whole story. So I hope tonight it will, uh, the debate will help enlighten uh, more folks. Amber, to a, to a large extent, doesn't what you were just describing, the situation with regard to Iran, doesn't that speak to the need for movement politics? I mean, the election's going to be over in a couple of days. Political parties are going to fade into the background. Yeah. Movements, it seems, have always been where the action is. Do we need, do we need to be uh, building a peace movement, for example? Well, I, I think that there needs to be some kind of a movement, Tom, because uh, right now the majority of Americans have no idea about the NDAA 2013, and they don't know that it's going to become, if this passes in the Senate, it's going to become U.S. policy to go to war with Iran, and and people don't know about this, and so so I think there does, we do need to have more movements, and what, whether it be in politics or or nonprofits coming out and and talking about what's going on, because the public is not being educated on these vital issues, and. 
and it, it's going to be too late. I mean, we'll be we'll be striking Iran before the majority of Americans e even know what's going on, and and they're being misled in into a war that they're really not being given a choice uh, as to whether or not they want their tax dollars to to be spent on it. No, free and equal. We've been doing some extensive research on the commission on presidential debates, and mm -hmm. I mean the, the the power and the money behind it is. Uh, 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 to, well, it's, uh, it's the parties. The parties, of course. It's mm -hmm. run by, I'm sure, as you all know, the former chair of the Democratic Republican Party. And I'll just kind of turn to you here a little bit, Tom. And I mean, how do you see uh, the difference between the debate we're doing tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern uh, uh, versus the commission and presidential debate? So why are you part of this one? Well, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I think that we need to be opening America up to multiple viewpoints and multiple discussions. There's a fundamental flaw in our Constitution and, and as you correctly pointed out, and you're really a scholar of many pieces of legislation that have consequently followed it, that have just cemented into place um, this this duopoly. This because you know Madison uh, in 1787, when you know he he was putting together the Federalist Papers, or they were he and Hamilton were writing these articles to try and sell the Constitution, came to this realization: Oh my God, you know we've got first past the post winner take all elections. How do, what, what do we do about this? Because if, if you have two parties, two factions, 51% so could win. That could, that's sort of democratic. But if you had three factions, somebody with 34% could win. Or four factions, somebody with 26%. And that's not democratic, small d democratic. So what do you do? And the only solution you could come up with is not to have political parties. It wasn't until 1861 that John Stuart Mill came along and said, well, how about proportional representation? Mm -hmm. And then instant runoff voting was developed in the 20th century. And it's been adopted by New Zealand and Australia. So I see these structural problems as things that need to be broken down so that we can have uh, multiple parties and multiple candidates and, and larger discussions. But the structural problems are not going to be, there's not going to be the pressure to change the structural, structural problems until, and, and, and it's because we're such an, an anachronistic democracy. I mean, you know, all the democracies created after 1861, after John Stuart Mill, by and large, have proportional representation. They're multi-party mm -hmm. systems. We're not. And, and so, although it could be done. So it, it seems like that, you know, without having multiple voices right now, without having third party debates, without having third, fourth, fifth, sixth, tenth, twelfth party candidates talking about these issues, we're not going to end up with, with the, the push for the change that we need. Well, it seems as if we're talking today, I mean, as you were part of the debate a couple of weeks ago, that yeah. millions of people, I was told, watched uh, moderated by Larry King. I, mm -hmm. I guess it was kind of there, but it was cool. It's just Larry Larry was so amazing and top 10 trending on Twitter. And, and jumping into Sam Cedar, you know, Sam, how do you how do you feel like social networking technology? It seems like that's been a huge change and and how it's going to impact the future. I mean, the youth, the 18 to 28 year olds, the no jobs, like you mentioned, why not run for office? You know, these independent individuals that are fed up with parties. Constitution doesn't even mention parties. Uh, what do you think about social networking technology and, and so on? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And uh, I hope that it, it remains as sort of as, as open and the, the access as open as possible. But, you know, w one thing that's uh, been amazing coming, uh, speaking to you now from, from New York in the, in the, in the wake of a, of a devastating hurricane uh, has been to see what uh, Occupy has done, uh, and along with a, with a couple other groups, including um, uh, 350.org, but they have been providing uh, services for people who have been stranded, uh, who have been left without power, who have not been eating, uh, who have been stuck in the cold uh, for for days now, and they've been doing it in a way that is been fundamentally more successful and um, they have executed this this type of relief service better than the Red Cross, better than the city, uh, better than FEMA. And it really is a great example of, of networking both off and online that uh, Occupy has done in a network that they have built. Uh, and I think this is a really important both a development and sort of an opportunity to see what has been developing. Uh, because it, uh, Occupy really didn't just evaporate, uh, it just became less prominent in the, in, in the media. And I think the, what they have done in the wake of Sandy is, is extremely encouraging, both from the perspective of knowing that they're still there, knowing how successful they have been in developing relationships with communities that are underserved, 
uh, and, and their, their, their ability to build an infrastructure, I think is going to be very important in the months and the years to come as we see the building of these movements. That it's what it's really ultimately going to take is, uh, I think, you know, it's good to educate uh, Americans via a political campaign. But at the end of the day, I think it's going to be social movements that start on the ground, that build, build real networks with other people that are really going to make a fundamental change in this country. Yeah. Christina, you were on my program, on my radio program earlier today, and you made the comment that you felt that political parties were dysfunctional and that we needed to move beyond them. How do we do that? What is that? What were you talking about? Sure. I mean, and in, in, in being involved with the presidential debate, and it was a miracle getting four candidates confirmed. Uh, Rocky Anderson from the Justice Party, Virgil Good with the Constitution Party, Gary Johnson, Libertarian, and Ms. Jill Stein, Dr. Jill Stein with the Green Party. I, I realized there was a real disconnect. Uh, from the bigger parties, primarily the Green Libertarian for sure, between the campaigns and the national parties. And, and knowing a lot of people in the national party, even the Green and Libertarian party, I recognize as they get bigger, as we already know with the Democrats and Republicans, they become infiltrated and they stop listing their constituents, you know, and, and that's not good. And so I decided to open up this little book called The Constitution. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in 98, my father ran for governor in Illinois. And, he got knocked off the ballot, and I thought, well, electoral reform is a real big issue here, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know I recognize in the in the in the book that parties don't work, uh, so you know it, it, I, I want the people, you know, in uniting honest media like we have here today, and you, Tom, and being on your show was so great. You're so humble, might I add, and Thanks. kind, and that's in the people here. I sense that as well, getting to know Amber and Sam, but uh, uniting these nice people and organizations and and honest people with integrity and recognizing that. You know, the system has been playing us for now two centuries, and, uh, and we got to break through that stranglehold by creating that national movement across the spectrum, uniting against the establishment and shining a light on money in both politics so, and media. So if somebody steps forward and says, I have, you know, a solution, or I have a, a you know, here are the 20 different things that I would do about everything from national security to the economy, how do they go forward in, in, in the process of be, uh, getting elected any kind of position without pulling around themselves a group of people and giving a brand or a name to it, in other words, creating a political party. Imagine a huge database that has all the information about this person, of what they stand for, how much money they've gotten in campaigns, a database, a, a movement uh, uniting all the honest media organizations, the interviews as tools, educational tools that are inspiring, educating these people uh, to run for office. Imagine a database that provides uh, the ability to overcome ballot access barriers. I, I worked as the National Ballot Access Coordinator for Ralph Nader in 2008, so I firsthand with leaders from legal to know how difficult and what it takes to get sure. on the ballot. So imagine all those tools of how to run a campaign, how to fundraise, you know, working with groups and bringing them together, raise millions of dollars for liberty or candidates across the spectrum. And those are the sort of things that I feel will evolve and come 2013 and opening the debates and instant runoff voting. And imagine your everyday person saying, yeah, I know what instant runoff voting is. I, I voted for that for a presidential debate. Yeah. Uh, so those are that's just the coming together. Wouldn't it be nice if everybody in America knew what instant runoff voting was? Uh, Sam, your, your thoughts on this? No, I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, election process. reform and uh, ballot access and fi uh, campaign finance, um, you know, these are sort of the, the, the keys, I think. And, you know, I almost feel like if any, if, if one thing, if there was reform in one area, it would start a sort of a cascade. I mean, I think there is a, there is a sense among the public that there are certain things you simply cannot change. I mean, I, you know, in my, um, uh, I have a fantasy that uh, there's going to be a, a split between the electoral and the popular vote in this election, and we would get rid of the electoral college. And, I, and I'm sort of convinced that if one thing went away, uh, if people could see that you could actually change the process in this fashion for the better, I think it would open up the floodgates. But, um, you know, hope springs eternal. And I've learned firsthand for the ballot access barriers how closely the two parties work together to keep uh, more voices and choices off the ballot, whether you're libertarian, independent, Ralph Nader, Ron Paul. Yeah. He even said number one reason he didn't run for president the last elections because of ballot access barriers. So, uh, you know, Ron Paul, Ralph Nader, they have really, Ross Perot even, have really shed a light on the need to, you know, to reform the electoral system and, of course, opening the debates, which is a, only one component of why we're here today. And, 
and, and, and discussing these, these important issues. Absolutely. Amber, I'm, I'm curious, mm -hmm. do you think that the Occupy movement might be, or even the Tea Party for that matter, and, and by that I don't mean the kind of institutional one funded by the Koch brothers, but just the average people who showed mm -hmm. up thinking that they were yeah. part of a grassroots movement, that those might be the early, early warning indicators is the wrong phrase because it sounds negative, but the early indicators, the, 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 the cracks in the wall uh, that, that show change, grassroots change coming to, the, coming to America? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as much as people want to, uh, especially within the mainstream media, they want to discount the Occupy movement as being a bunch of um, hippies who, who don't know what they're doing. Uh, as Sam was saying, it's an extremely organized movement. I've, I've been going around uh, covering events for, for a book I'm doing for the past year and, and photographing and really kind of sitting back and, and analyzing what's going on. And it's, it's amazing how self-sufficient these movements are and how, how passionate and, and educated the participants are as to what's really going on in the country. So if we are able to finally open up the elections to, to a third party, party, um, I, I would be hard-pressed not to find uh, a passionate Tea Partier or occupier who, who would join that movement as well. I think another thing we need to overcome, really, is the fear amongst people who are upset with Democrats and Republicans. They have a fear to kind of accept a third party because they're so terrified of either Romney getting elected or Obama getting elected that, that they'll just throw their vote to the other candidate. And, and that's another huge obstacle that, that I think um, you all will have to, to overcome as well, Christina, is, is getting people to overcome that fear and actually accept third party debates and that there could be another candidate in, into off, uh, that, that is elected. Oh, Amber, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I do foresee the, the grassroots component of Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party. They were both co-opted in their own way by the establishment, big money. And so there's a lot of people just hanging there. And that's like, those are the kind of people that are attracted to what we're doing here tonight with this debate. And as I mentioned before, I just don't see parties working. But there's a huge, huge uh, uproar of these independents uh, mm -hmm. that are really uh, starting. I see a huge uprising of independents. Uh, those those kids cannot be underestimated. They're going to be a huge game changer for the 2014 uh, local race. You think this on. is a generational thing? Well, it could be. The baby boomers yeah. are facing, and the, the youth and the social networking. I mean, again, top ten on Twitter, our last uh, debate. I mean, here we are, a grassroots organization. And, of course, we couldn't have done it with Larry King, yourself being there, and bringing this media together. We're so much more powerful. There's far more honest people in the world than there's not. And um, it's just has been so great connecting everybody. And I, I do foresee people will get very involved, and, and they won't have any more fear. They won't be li uh, we're already living in fear in the sense of how bad things can get. So uh, why not overcome that and uh, be strong and be leaders and, uh, and, and, and put a stop to it? and move forward yeah, indeed. Move forward. And that's going to wrap up our first conversation. Thanks for joining us, Sam and Amber. <laughs> We're just about a half hour away from the final third party debates between Governor Gary Johnson and Dr. Jill Stein. We'll pre preview more right after this. I will fight for oil, coal, and natural gas. I also promise that I fight every single day on behalf of the American people. Take it, go to Congress, fight for it. I have my own plan. A Green Party president means the start of a new economy that serves all of us. That's what we deserve. What we don't deserve is pandering irresponsible bullshit passes itself off as campaigning. I'm voting for Jill Stein! Vote for Jill Stein! We need a Green President! Vote for Jill Stein! We need Jill Stein for President! Vote for Jill Stein. I'm Jill Stein, Green Party candidate for president, and I approve this message. Here's Mitt Romney trying to figure out the name of that thing that we Americans call a donor. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just a guy who cares an awful lot about my country. You, sir, are a fool. You know what? That is mine. Are there terrorist cells in your Far neighborhood? Left.
does not want the USA to defeat terrorism. You cannot be a liberal and a Christian. Republicans lie. It's really so stupid. <laughs> You know, the corporate media distracts us from what you and I should care about because they're a profit-driven industry that sells us sensationalistic garbage and calls it breaking news. I'm Abby Martin, and we're going to break the set. Welcome back. I'm Tom Hartman, host of The Big Picture. And I'm Christina Tobin, founder of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. And we're less than a half an hour away from the final U.S. presidential debates between Governor Gary Johnson of the Libertarian Party and Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party. Both were selected by you, our viewers, in the last debate on October 23rd in Chicago. But before we get to that, let's talk about the issues. Yep. Joining us from New York, from our New York studio, is Matt Welsh, editor-in-chief of Reason Magazine and from Los Angeles, journalist Nathaya Alhassan, or Matha Alhassan, my mm -hmm. apologies. And Hello, welcome. Thanks for Hi. having us. Hey, Thank Matha. you. Hey, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, both of you. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Matha, what, what is the thing that, that most interests you about, I was going to say third party politics, but we need another term, be, going beyond the duopoly. Ah, that's a beautiful term. <laughs> um, I actually want to think about what Martin Luther King said in 1967. He addressed his congregation and more so his followers in the United States, and he compelled his congregation to address what he called the triple evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism. And I am hopeful that the beyond duopoly debates will try to address these three issues, because it's been 40 plus years later, and we still have not had a sufficient look at these three issues, and these three issues that are so intermittently twined together um, that they all affect, affect each other. I think later on we're going to be addressing the issue of U.S. intervention into other countries around the world and why we're still in Afghanistan. And I think this also directs very critically to how African Americans and Latinos are treated in the U.S. and also connects to our ever-expanding prison population, which we did not address in the Democratic and Republican debates at all. Um, and I hope and I wonder if it's going to come up this time. It's an excellent, excellent point. Well, definitely, I foresee that happening, and uh, and thank you so much. It's a great to have you here, Matha. And uh, going over to, to Matt Welch with Reason Magazine, I know that they were one of many media outlets that covered our last debate, mm -hmm. uh, moderated by Larry King. So thank you for that, Matt, uh, with Reason Thanks Magazine. Thanks for having it. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I definitely have uh, hung, I've hanged out with, uh, hung out, that is, with your uh, David Knott, your president, Adrian Moore, your VP. Good guys, good crew, of in <laughs> lots of integrity there. So why are you here tonight? What, what attracts you to this, uh, this debate, this movement that I foresee evolving here? And, and uh, why are you here tonight? Well, uh, because you invited me, and thank you very much for both hosting this and in inviting me. Actually, it's interesting, Tom mentioned Beyond Duopoly. That was actually the uh, name of the first chapter in a book that I co-authored with Reasons, Nick Gillespie, last year, that talks specifically about this. How do we get not just beyond the physical kind of reality of the Democratic and Republican camps and the candidates, but how do we get beyond the thinking uh, that kind of produces that or, or that it is that it is enforced by this very stale, you know, the other guy's evil, so I hate him type of uh, thinking that we have. And if you look around in all other aspects of our life beyond politics, uh, we actually don't really believe or participate in duopolies the way we do. We don't affiliate with brands the way that we used to affiliate and be a Chevy family or be a Toyota family or whatever the hell it was. Um, we've all moved on. We, we've enjoyed and participated in this kind of great 
uh, scrum of life. Politics is where the good stuff in life happens last. And I think a, an essential first step into creating the world that we all of us here, regardless of what we think philosophically, which, which definitely differs, um, that we all want to inhabit, the way that we do it is that we begin, uh, the old joke uh, during, uh, during communism was perestroika begins in the home. Well, like getting beyond duopoly begins between your ears. And so it's important to participate in exercises like this, which on the one hand, acknowledge Knowledge the many areas that we've been talking about here all night in which the two parties, once in power especially, the way they act when they're in power, act similarly. Uh, so you get the kind of grotesque moment in the third and final debate where there's a question about drones and basically President Obama said, well, drones are, are great and Romney says, I think they're great too, let's move on. Uh, so it's important to create a space where we have a different conversation about drones, uh, but it's equally important to talk about ways in which our two candidates tonight are uh, very strongly disagree with one another. Let's get beyond the sort of, uh, you know, practical horse race politics uh, questions of, uh, you know, are you going to spoil it for this party, for that party, and talk about economic economic issues uh, for which uh, these two candidates strongly disagree. It's part of the way that we can have a philosophical uh, a conversation about politics in a way that roots around the kind of traditional top-down model which aims to sort of set goalposts uh, on the 35-yard lines and omit everything beyond it. Great, and thank you for that. And, and Mesa, we were talking the other night uh, you have a lot of compassion for Syria and yeah. uh, Iran and, and how the U.S. government has an impact in these countries that means so much to you. Can you elaborate on that just from your heart and, and your experiences and, and what we could do to fix the, the problems that we have in those countries here in America? Chris yeah, yeah. Chris Christina, I must admit that you'll have to excuse me if I'm at a loss for words because I am intimately affected by what is going on in Syria. I have family in um, cities that I don't want to disclose because I don't know what's going to happen to them if I do disclose the fact that they're connected to me. Um, I am honestly so disheartened by what's going on because the people within Syria have been leading an uprising against the government and of course it's fracturous but they've unknowingly caught themselves in a geopolitical proxy war and because of the monumental nature of the powers that are involved and the politics that are involved and the arms sales that are involved and the potential oil sales that could be involved, um, we have distracted ourselves from the humanity of the of the war in Syria, the uprising in Syria, whatever you want to call it. I just, I sometimes even refer to it as a massacre and a humanitarian disaster. Um, I do know that it is sadly setting up the stage for um, a possible discussion about a war with Iran. And um, this, as you saw it, very um, strongly discussed during the last debate. The last debate between Obama and Romney was about foreign policy. And so what, what, did, what did Romney say his foreign policy was about? His foreign policy from the get-go was about killing the evil guys. And if you can reproduce an understanding of us versus them and good versus evil, like Matt was talking about, then you can put in the same formula when you are talking about Iran and Iran arming the Syrian government. And if Iran is arming the Syrian government and they're killing their population, they're evil guys. And oh, they might strike Israel. They're evil guys too. So maybe that's our next foreign policy um, decision we need to make, or actually for Romney, it's um, about China as a currency manipulator. But um, I, uh, I, again, I, I, I sometimes don't know what to say because I am so involved in what's going on in there. Metha, do you think that it's possible, uh, uh, just a slight digression, but I'm really genuinely interested in your, your thoughts on this. You, you are very well informed. Do you think it's possible that the reason why there wasn't so much response from the Obama administration to Syria as there was in previous, uh, Libya for example, uh, could simply have been the election that he was, that Obama felt that he was in a position where if he took a chance and blew it, he would blow the entire presidential campaign and so he's just stretching this thing out and that there may be more efforts to resolve this after, day after tomorrow? I think that there is definitely a cost-benefit analysis going on, and the cost-benefit analysis is that there are so many risks 
that, as you appropriately outlined, are outweighing the possible benefits. And so right now, too, I mean, how can you focus in on a country that most Americans had never heard about since before March 2011 while you're trying to campaign in Ohio. So yes, I, d I definitely do think that American uh, domestic politics are going to trump what's going on in Syria. And I know that there are some other issues that, that um, they are trying to tease out, and one of them being what sort of opposition that they could support and whether or not there is some extremist influence within the um, Free Syrian Army. But do you have hope for resolution after the election? Um, I believe res resolution will come from the people, not from outside. And that's where my Great hope answer. lies. Yeah. Well, I can jump to Matt. So it's hard to transition from that. <laughs> Thank you, Mesa. Give me goosebumps once again. Uh, but Matt, uh, I know tonight, uh, you know, questions will be asked by our correspondents. And, you know, I know you have a lot of passion behind the, the Federal Reserve, you know, through Reason Magazine and or yourself individually and uh, the power of that, Wall Street. and. You know, can you elaborate on, again, how the two-party stranglehold? You know, we've seen Ralph Nader, Ron Paul come out together, you know, for ending the Federal Reserve back in the day on Judge Napolitano. And I don't know if, if you could elaborate a little bit on how we have those things in common. And, and uh, yeah. Well, it's interesting to, to point out, I mean, if you were going to talk about the Federal Reserve in the context of American electoral politics in 2007 and 2008, people would treat you like you were an insane person. Uh, and basically the only person talking about this with any regularity was Ron Paul. Uh, Ron Paul had a uh, kind of an end run around usual politics. Uh, you know, I think that there's a great stat that something like of the people who supported Ron Paul in the 2008 uh, primaries and caucuses, only 35 percent ended up voting for John McCain. He was just drawing a different electorate, and those people have different concerns. Uh, his two big rallying cries were anti-war, uh, and anti-federal reserve and he created a politics for this uh, he was uh, laughed and dismissed out of hand by the kind of bipartisan Washington consensus on everything and he makes the argument the sort of Austrian school of economics which I'm not necessarily the biggest adherent of as they will be the first to tell you uh, but uh, the theory or the uh, idea that they've had for a very long time is that when you have a government monopoly on, on money supply, you're going to create these bubbles and they're going to be much more damaging than if you had a more kind of competitive and less opaque situation. Um, and so this, this is kind of a root part of this. And a lot of these people uh, predicted the crisis and the way that it, it rolled out. And so now there's a politics for it precisely because someone from outside of the system uh, created his own and the people around him, more importantly, created their own reality and forced people to at least deal with it to the extent to now that there's audit the Fed legislation um, uh, uh, that has bipartisan support on Capitol Hill. Whether it'll ever get anywhere is another question. And Mitt Romney uh, actually uh, uh, cottoned off on uh, some of this in the Republican Party platform as a sop to the Ron Paul people and that kind of populist end around this. And it kind of ties into some things that you were talking about previously. Like, what do you, how can you deal with these two monolithic or, or attempt it to be monolithic uh, political parties. Well, one is to acknowledge that they don't have as much sway on us as, as they used to. Independents are now the largest voting bloc of people who affiliate uh, one way or the other. They're up around 40 percent uh, compared to uh, fewer for the other two parties. Another is to make those two parties more responsive to the needs that people and the desires that people have within those tents. So we've seen that happen with the Tea Party a lot, uh, uh, not as much to the point where they actually got a candidate who is any way reflective of the Tea Party in Mitt Romney, but they tried to make the Republican Party more responsive to fiscal conservatism. Um, hopefully we'll begin to see that on the left on issues like the drug war uh, and a lot of these civil liberties issues that we've been talking about um, in ways where Democrats actually start to get punished for being so consistently lousy on them. The Federal Reserve uh, politics of the Federal Reserve are an example of how we just started to see a change thanks to Ron Paul and there'll be a vigorous discussion about this tonight and we didn't see that kind of discussion much in the uh, the big presidential scrum between the two parties uh, and that's one way that we can affect politics now is that we can sort of force people, force the two parties to start being more responsive. Whether that means we can ever begin to trust them, I uh, tend to think not, oh, uh, yeah. but it's certainly a new uh, 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 avenue for doing things. Okay, Matt, yeah. thank you very thank much. You. That's gonna do it for now. Join, thanks for joining us, Matt and Matha. Thank you. Thank you for having us.
the final, the final, right. <laughs> the final, the final debate between Gary Johnson and Jill Stein is just minutes away. Until then, I'm Christina Tobin, founder of Free and Equal Elections Foundation. And I'm Tom Hartman, host of The Big Picture. The anchors of RT had a bit to say about these third-party candidates earlier. Take a look at their discussion, and we'll see you at debate time. Happy Election Eve, everyone. Coming up shortly in RT America studios here in Washington, D.C., the final debate before the election. It's a third-party debate tonight, featuring Libertarian Gary Johnson, the former governor of New Mexico, and Dr. Jill Stein of the Green Party. Now, you may remember this debate was scheduled for last Tuesday, October 30th, but was moved to tonight due to Superstorm Sandy. So here we are one night before the presidential election, and we want to remind you that for most of you across the United States, when you go to the polls tomorrow, there will be more than two names on the ballot. In addition to the two I just mentioned, who will be part of tonight's debate, you may also see on your ballot Virgil Good, a former U.S. congressman from Virginia, now with the Constitution Party, and Rocky Anderson of the Justice Party, former mayor of Salt Lake City, Utah. Tonight, though, we are down to the two candidates based on an online vote taken after that first third-party debate on October 23rd. And in preparation, I'd like to talk more about the significance of this debate and about third-party candidates in general with RT correspondent Liz Wall, along with RT's Abby Martin, host of Breaking the Set. Ladies, great to have you here. Thanks. Christine. Great to be here. Um, lots to talk about. Uh, this debate, as we know, it, it was supposed to be a week ago. Kind of um, fun, I think, that it's happening the night before the election. Uh, it's important, don't you think, that, that people know that there are other candidates out there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just sad that people don't know that. I mean, a lot of people that I talk to, they're just like, well, you know, it doesn't matter. And they're just watching these, you know, total dog and pony show, billion dollar campaign glitz and glamour of the presidential commission on debates, which we already know is, is funded entirely by corporations that totally exclude third party voices. And then on top, you know, on top of that, the corporate controlled media establishment, everything you see on TV just completely excludes these extremely important voices that need to be heard and that are totally eligible. Well, I think I, I want to touch on something you just said, that, that sort of doesn't matter attitude. I, I, I certainly, and Liz, I know that you've spoken to many people uh, about this, too, that, that so many people in this country really think uh, they have to vote for one of these two candidates. And history has dictated that it's probably going to be either Obama or, or Romney. But talk a little bit about what, what people have told you in your interviews, your uh, vast amount of interviews uh, during this campaign season about sort of the attitude uh, concerning the third party. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there is this perception that voting for the third party is a wasted vote. But I think um, especially with the way things are going in the country now that people aren't there isn't as much enthusiasm behind President Obama as there was back in 2008. A lot of people disillusioned with the way things had played out during his presidency. Um, and um, a lot of not uh, even on the Republican side, they're not all gung ho about Mitt Romney. So um, I think now more than ever, there is there seems to be space for other ideas um, uh, aside from the Republican and Democratic uh, ticket, especially um, we saw the passion behind Ron Paul, who, of course, you know, is running under the Republican ticket, but really does differentiate himself from the Republican mainstream um, in terms of his foreign policy, his non-interventionist approach. And we saw a lot of passion and a lot of enthusiasm behind him. So we see that there is um, an, a hunger in this country for, um, for a different for an alternative. Yeah, when Ron Paul was still in the race, it was interesting just how much energy and support um, the people who, who, you know, backed him had. Uh, I think it's it's important to what you brought up, Liz. You said it's not just about other candidates, about other it's about other ideas. And that's one of the most frustrating thing, I think, for a lot of these candidates who do not get invited uh, to the debates during the primaries. It is not only that their face wasn't shown and that their name wouldn't get out there, but that their ideas um, would not get out there as well. So I want to play something really quick. This is from that October 23rd debate we were talking about um, from Libertarian candidate uh, Gary Johnson speaking about the political system as it is in place today. Whether or not Romney gets elected or Obama gets elected, three things are going to happen. We're going to find ourselves with a continued heightened police state in this country. We're going to find ourselves continuing to militarily intervene in the world, which results has resulted in hundreds of millions of enemies to this country that wouldn't otherwise exist. There's a reason why we shouldn't be using drones. It's because we don't just take out the target. We take out a lot of innocent civilians in these countries where these drones attack. All right. 
And then lastly, we are going to find ourselves in a continued state of unsustainable spending okay. and borrowing to the point that we are going to experience a monetary collapse unless we fix this. So uh, too much spending and borrowing, that is a topic that, that you know, all the candidates seem to have spoken on. But drones, I remember when a question was asked about drones in uh, the final, uh, that foreign policy debate between Obama and Romney, people on Twitter were like, I can't believe they're asking about drones. This is so insignificant. Um, but in fact, Abby, uh, the topic of drones <laughs> is the opposite of insignificant. Well, yeah, I mean, when it's the leading cause of anti-American sentiment in the Middle East, we have the foreign minister of Pakistan coming out saying that is the number one cause. And also there, this suicide bombings with in Pakistan after drone warfare started in the country has escalated 300 percent. Um, so when you say that it's insignificant, that's outrageous. I'm saying people on Twitter oh, yeah, said no, that. I'm not you. <laughs> not you. Yeah. I know RT cares about drones, but I mean, yeah, it just shows you. And, you know, Mitt Romney kind of saying, oh, yeah, I totally agree with Obama's policies on drones. Um, I think it's a great idea. Well, it's actually not. They have a 98 percent failure rate and it's really not surgically precise. It also is just terrorizing people on a daily basis. And that's just in Pakistan. I mean, this is going this is covert warfare going all across the Middle East and also opening up drones to U.S. skies soon in a year. And it's a shame that this wasn't discussed more in the other debate. And that's, it's interesting that um, that clip that we just played of uh, Gary Johnson, where he said no matter whether it's Romney or Obama, that the outcome is going to be the same. And I think that exemplifies the need um, or the desire that is there for a third party option. Um, we saw in the last debate um, focused on foreign policy, every single candidate, I believe, brought up drones. Um, so it's the last third party debate. You're the last about, third yeah. party debate. Yeah. And then, and then the the main debate. Debate, it was brought up once, right. and we had Governor Romney basically hail um, Obama's <laughs> drone campaign. So we see that they definitely do agree with it, and, and it seems to be a bipartisan issue where it, that is something that is going to continue despite the controversy surrounding it and very little uh, discussion about it. Especially uh, also in terms of foreign policy, we see that uh, Romney and Obama agree on Iran. Uh, Ob uh, Romney seems to want to slap more sanctions on Iran, and that's been, the, that's been um, Obama's signature. Uh, the way that he has dealt with, with Iran is, is continuing to slap these sanctions on the country that are now crippling the country. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Romney says that he's going to be more strict on, on sanctions, but it's, it's yeah. how, how much more uh, they seem to <laughs> well, agree Romney, on. How much more crippling can the sanctions really be? And I love how people are like, you know, Obama, um, oh, Romney will attack Iran, whereas Obama won't. We don't know that. I mean, all right. we know is that they both kind of, you know, are, are putting a really hard line against Iran. We both know that they, you know, they are trying to compete with Netanyahu and, and who can be more favorable to Israel. So I don't really see, I don't put anything um, out of the possibility for Obama. It's so in interesting Iran. regarding Iran, too, because uh, it, it seems like people like to play this up as uh, the biggest boogeyman, um, you know, facing us right now. It's the biggest threat right now. It, it, Iran has been that way for and decades. And it was reiterated by one of the moderators. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it, it's really been like this for decades. And right. I, I think a lot of people forget that. Um, we talk about, as you just mentioned, uh, the, the two candidates, the two main candidates, Obama and Romney, really agreeing on a lot, especially uh, foreign policy related. Um, but I should say, and, and and for those of people, the RT viewers who actually have been following these thir third party debates, it might be a little confusing. We have, we're having the one tonight, uh, very soon. Uh, we have the one uh, on October 23rd. These are um, both put on by the Free and Equal Elections Foundation. But last night, uh, Ralph Nader, everybody remembers good old Ralph Nader, he actually moderated a debate here in DC at Bus Boys and Poets. And he asked the candidates, um, all four of them were at this debate, he asked them a series of yes or no questions, um, things like military spending, the war in Afghanistan, the size of the defense the defense budget, the strength of corporate power in Washington, um, and all four candidates uh, pretty much agreed on all of that. So do you, do you think it's hard for some people who, who do plan on voting third party to choose which third party candidate? No, because I think that when you're looking at the third party candidates and they all agree on things that pretty much is uniform with the rest of American citizens who are just like, I don't want to be spending over 50% of our tax dollars on the military. I don't want to have endless war in Afghanistan until 2024. I don't want to have endless drone warfare. And so when these third party candidates, they all agree on the things that we can all agree on too. And that's the biggest difference. They all have radically different platforms when it comes to you know energy policy and, and just their outlook on how to restructure government. 
right? But in terms of those questions, civil liberties, protecting all these things, I think that that is where people can really relate to them because we sure as hell can't relate to the Romney. And particular, no particularly <laughs> with the Libertarian Party, I think that really does um, uh, represent a growing segment of the American population, this uh, um, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. A lot of people, especially young people, mm -hmm. um, go along with that ideal, yet... Um, we don't really see it on either side. Certainly the foundation of the Libertarian Party is smaller, smaller government. And you do see some of these ideas that Ron Paul's been talking about since the 1980s uh, sort of become adopted by the Republican Party this year. Even in their um, party platform, for example, they, they implemented an audit of the Fed, which is something that Ron Paul has been calling for a long time that uh, was unheard of a few years ago. Um, so it's really interesting. I, I don't want to leave uh, Jill Stein out. Uh, I want to make sure that um, you know we play something from her. Um, I know that, that under President Obama, one of the most significant things that's happened, um, not because of President Obama, he was against it, but the Supreme Court ruled on the Citizens United a case, case. This, of course, um, put very simply, uh, money, e e corporations are, are people too kind of thing. Uh, so I want to just play something Jill Stein said about this and about how Citizens United has affected our system. We are calling for getting money out of politics through public financing. We're calling for opening up the airwaves to all qualified candidates. We are calling for a constitutional ten amendment sec ten seconds, to clarify Jill. that money is not speech and that corporations are not people to take back our constitutional rights. Liz, you and I have been all over this, uh, certainly, uh, you know, anchoring the news here at RT. This has been one of our biggest focal points in this campaign season because, uh, first of all, it's a very important issue, but second of all, because the mainstream media has largely ignored it. The, the day the, the case was ruled on, I think back in 2010, uh, it, it was discussed, but really uh, the impact. There are so many different directions that you could go uh, with the impact of this case and how it has and forever. And we're seeing the impact of it today. I mean, a record spending on campaigning, um, I think they're both in the ballpark of $350 million, and that doesn't take into account a lot of the other spending that was pumped into these, uh, to the campaigns, and a lot of it um, negative, negative campaigning we're seeing uh, unprecedented. Um, so absolutely, and, and we, we just heard out of uh, the words of Jill Stein, I think it's inter interesting, she said, you know, um, corporations are not people. Romney actually did say the opposite, that corporations are people. Um, so it's interesting to hear from a presidential candidate to say otherwise. Now, I don't know, are, are you guys going to miss campaign season? Oh my God, I can't wait for it to be over. I, I'm not going to miss it. <laughs> I'm going to miss it a, a little bit. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I love this ads. stuff. All what are my... they going to be talking about on the news? 2014, I mean... come on, it's right around the yeah, corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, hopefully we're going to definitely get some Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, why did this happen? You know, uh, why did Obama win? Why did Obama yeah. lose? You know, we post election, be, the post, post election we analysis. We talking about the voting fraud going on probably. Yeah, but. it's going to be interesting. I think I think it's exciting. I think um, you know RT, of course, uh, going to be uh, doing quite a bit of election coverage uh, tomorrow from 4 p.m. Eastern until midnight or until uh, there's a winner. So uh, RT correspondent Liz Wall, Abby Martin, host of Breaking the Set. Fun time, girls. Thank Come back you. and see me again. Oh, for sure. Thank you. Once again, live at 9 p.m. tonight, the Free and Equal Foundation's second round of third-party debates. It's going to be happening right here in RT's studio. So make sure to tune in and find out for yourself what these third-party candidates stand for.